Hello there, and welcome to this short presentation detailing my experience of building the Hobby Boss 1350th SMS Seidlitz. The German battlecruisers of the First World War can make a strong claim to be the best capital ships for their displacement of any nation at that time. Rakish, distinctive lines were features of ships that passed the ultimate test of any warship, their performance in battle. Their survivability record compared to that of their British counterparts at Jutland is well known, and although this is not just down to differences in design, such things as less stable British cordite and less safe ammunition handling practices were also factors, figures in war, like sport, don't lie. At Jutland, Seidlitz was hit more times than any other ship to survive the battle, surviving the punishment that none of her British counterparts could have sustained. Despite 21 heavy hits, two medium calibre hits and a torpedo strike, she managed to get home and was repaired in just over three months. I bought my kit online direct from China. At £60 not only was this at least £10 cheaper than from any UK supplier, and that included the postage, it arrived in little over a week. There was a bit of a kink in the box as you can see in the picture, but the contents were fine. First impressions of the kit were favourable. A proliferation of cleanly moulded and well packed plastic parts, 338 of them, with a lot of fine detail evident. Even more impressive is the etched brass provision. Four separate frets with a total of 188 parts, plus a length of metal chain for the anchors. Some of the previous ship kits I've had experience of have included some etched parts, but usually they only do half the job, requiring you to buy and add some more of your own to get things done properly. Not so this time. Everything you need is included from the start. Closer inspection of the parts did reveal one or two issues. The deck planking is not particularly well represented, with the detailing appearing a bit clumsy and overdone. Also, there's no representation of the plate lines on the hull. This is particularly evident at the bow, where a comparison with any of the good quality photos of the actual ship will show exactly what I mean. Another issue is the prominent ventilation areas at the funnel bases. These were complex areas, not easy to represent accurately in kit form, and Hobby Boss have oversimplified them, in my view. The box art shows the ship with anti-torpedo booms and nets, but these are not included in the actual kit. Not a problem if you wish to represent the Seidlitz in her post-Jutland configuration, as the torpedo nets were removed from all German capital ships after that battle. However, to truly represent her in her post-Jutland form, there are several other modifications necessary that you'll need to add yourself. Building the hull was straightforward although the pieces are large and take some holding and taping to fit them together successfully. No provision for waterline construction is made, so some serious cutting will be required through thick plastic if waterline is the option for you. The three main deck pieces fitted well, with just a tiny amount of filler required in some places. At this stage I undertook my first bit of kit enhancement by adding a representation of those plate lines at the bow end of the ship. Plenty of good quality photos are available to show what needs to be done. I used thin strips of very thin plastic card held in place with masking tape and fixed with liquid cement. Care needs to be taken not to let the cement run under the masking tape and mar the surface of the plastic. I used little dabs to effectively spot weld the strips in position, then remove the tape and glue them properly. The lower section of the hull was primed with Hulford's red plastic primer, lightly rubbed down and then finished with white enzyme models RN19 anti-fouling red. This wasn't applied overall, but in masked patches to give a less uniform overall finish. The upper hull was primed with Holford's grey plastic primer and finished with Humbrol 147 which is a matte pale grey. The actual paint schemes and shades of the World War I German battlecruisers seem still open to some debate, with photographs sometimes giving contradictory evidence about the same vessel. 
I personally have considerable doubts though about the two-tone scheme suggested by the painting guide included in the kit and just use a single shade overall on my model. The anchor chains are provided as metal items and before fitting them I treated them with AK's photo etch burnishing solution. Two applications turned the chains to a convincing dark gunmetal grey and meant they could be installed without having to be painted. The prominent capstans are enhanced with photo etch detail and look good. For all deck painting I used Vallejo acrylics. Panzer Aces 315 light mud was used to represent the wood with model colour 70983 flat earth to represent the linoleum covering on the platform decks. There is one of those self-adhesive wood decks available for this kit, but I have to say these items never look totally convincing to me, so I saved £18 and did without. The aftermost section of the superstructure includes the main mast and searchlight platforms. Although this is a fairly complex structure, it assembled well, largely due to the excellent fit of all the component parts. One addition I made was to replace the slightly overscaled searchlight davits with items fabricated from brass wire. An enforced modification was the replacement of most of the upper mast components with brass rod and more wire. This was due to the plastic parts being so finely moulded that I broke some of them getting them off the sprue. One post-Jutland addition to the turrets was the provision of life rafts on each side as well as an extra pair on the superstructure at the base of the second funnel. These were fabricated from plastic card and etched brass mesh. When reviewing my previous Hobby Boss 1350th warship, the Voltaire, I was critical of the boats for being short of detail. Well, thanks for listening Hobby Boss, for the items here are much improved. They're etched brass chocks and rudders, they've got separate thwarts and generally more detail. Still no oars though, I had to add these myself and the whalers mounted on the davits continue to be a problem. The davits are very good, with beautifully represented hooks, but the boats have nothing through which these hooks can be put. I made tiny eyes from the finest wire I could find, fixed these in the boats and then hooked them onto the davits. Slightly annoying, as this fault also appeared in the Voltaire. Constructing the central part of the superstructure, which consists of the aft funnel and its base, together with the very prominent and distinctive boat cranes, is a fairly straightforward task. But watch out for the tight funnel ribs. The cabling on the cranes is represented by etched brass. I was originally going to replace them with stretched sprue as I thought this would be finer, but in fact the etched bits looked okay when assembled and painted, so I left them alone. The bridge and fore funnel are a complex area that involve a lot of etched brass work and some careful painting. It was a time consuming and fiddly task but looked good at the end. Watch out again for those etched brass ribs that go round the outside of the funnel. I found them a very tight fit and easily distorted when you try to put them in place. The wheelhouse and port starboard lookout stations are made from folded brass. I found there were gaps left along some of the seams after they'd been folded. A thread of super glue gel is a good way of addressing this. I assembled the foremast but didn't actually fix it in place until later in the build so it didn't get damaged. The mast components are finely moulded but the three radio aerial spreaders are still over scale and were replaced with brass wire. The turret tops on the real ship were painted either dark grey or black and I used Vallejo 7995 German grey for this and indeed all the other black areas on the ship as well such as the funnel caps. Also after Jutland two of the turrets carried prominent concrete patches as repaired for damage sustained during the battle. These are not featured in the kit so need adding if you're doing the post Jutland fit. I used shape plastic card to do the job the two turrets concerned are B turret on the front face and D turret the back face and photos in various reference books show adequately how to do this. Turrets A and D also had prominent white circles painted on their roofs as an air recognition aid. 
These are provided as decals, which adhered well, but had quite a lot of carrier film that needed careful trimming to ensure a good fit around the rather complex shape of the rangefinder on the turret roof. With regard to weathering, pre- and early war German capital ships were almost immaculate, so heavy weathering is not appropriate. Later in the war, post-Jutland, standards appear to have slipped a bit. Therefore I applied rather more weathering than I normally do, while still trying to follow the maxim that less is more. When it comes to rigging, no information is included in the kit, so photos have to provide the necessary information. I never try to include all the rigging on a warship model because it can very easily look overdone. Even the finest stretch brew is slightly over scale and this becomes more obvious the more of it you use. I try to do just enough to add extra interest and enhance the appearance without ever trying to add everything. Adding flags as a final touch is always a good move but it's frustrating that none are included on the kit decal sheet. A strange omission in my view as they were put on the previous mentioned Voltaire. Anyway, not to worry, a bit of research turned up some aftermarket items from Starling models. So to conclude, another very worthy ship kit from Hobby Boss. It has no major faults as far as I can see and makes a good model straight from the box. Particularly welcome is the comprehensive provision of etched parts, which means that the usual expensive foray into the aftermarket is not necessary and makes the kit good value for money. I only hope this product has enough commercial success to encourage the manufacturers to turn out more 1/350th scale subjects from this long underrepresented period of naval history. How about a British battle cruiser next time? Thank you for listening. Hope you found this enjoyable and useful. I look forward to you joining me again sometime in the future. Goodbye for now.